Welcome back guys. Well today I'm headed out in the woods and we're just taking a look around and scouting for some foraging sites for next season. Let me tell you this winter has been long 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 and now with a nice warm sun out I can hardly wait for spring and foraging season to begin once more. Well, this year we had over eight feet of snow fall since October. Now we're down to about four or five in the bush, so it's been really tough to get around. I'm out exploring a new area that I'll be foraging this year. So um, taking a look at the tree species around, uh, checking for any special landscape features, snags, things like that, so that I can uh, figure out what I'm going to find this spring, summer and fall. Here I'm coming up on a cedar swamp, so it's sort of a lowland area. It's going to tend to be a little bit moist compared to other parts of the woods. So in here, we're going to find plants and trees that love getting their feet wet. I love these areas. You know, they're pretty special. We have a huge old cedar swamp at our property. And in these areas, you can find lots of wildlife. There's lots of great coverage because, uh, especially this time of year, um, the deer and moose like to hang out in here, um, browse, and get shelter from a lot of the heavy snow. What I'm looking for in here come, you know, summertime is Lactarius. Lactarius thinos loves to be around uh, cedars. So I've got this spot marked out. I'm hoping to head back here uh, when things thaw so that I can check for those mushrooms. So sometimes in these cedar swamps, I can also find um, a few fallen hardwoods or a few hardwoods that have kind of, uh, you know, gotten a little bit too soggy and, and died. I've actually found a few dryad saddle in sort of low-lying areas with cedar as long as there's some hardwood around because dryad grows off of hardwood so uh, you know just because you're seeing mainly conifers keep your eyes open there's also other trees in the area and they may support other uh, mushrooms in this area I'm really excited I found a lot of beech trees so beech are characterized by their very smooth gray bark pretty excited to see a healthy stand of beech trees we have a beech bark disease here in Ontario, which is caused by a combination of an insect and a fungus that causes severe dieback on beech trees. I think I'd heard an estimate that you know the majority of our beech trees will be gone in the province within the next uh, decade or so. Uh, that's kind of frightening because beech um, beech woodlands support a lot of wildlife. Uh, they produce the beech nut. You know. It's a Tons of birds, deer love this kind of environment. Uh, and of course, beech trees uh, provide an environment uh, that is good for black trumpet mushrooms, one of my favorites. So um, you guys saw that I was able to get some this year uh, from a farm in BC. They had a, you know, they had some in the store in my area and uh, I picked some up and tried them and oh my gosh, they were so good. So it's a craterellus species of mushroom and they quite often are found in beech forests. So I'm pretty pumped that I, I have this forest right in uh, you know, my area so that I can, uh, I can go looking for the black trumpet mushroom and of course, subsequent wildlife watching as well. Fun fact about beech trees, I don't know if you know this, but uh, Budweiser beer, they age the beer with beechwood chips in a secondary fermentation process. I guess it imparts uh, a very mild taste to the beer. So. Gotta love beech trees. I just want to show you a couple of uh, squirrel drays. So those are um, basically nests that squirrels have in the trees to stay warm. And they're going to be rearing their young now, actually. They've got some young most likely in the nest right now. So right there and right there uh, is what we're looking at. So um, they're getting ready. The little ones will be hitting the ground in about a couple months. One important thing to take on the trail with you when you're, uh, you know, scouting for your, you know, your foraging adventure um, for the next few months is uh, your GPS unit. So I have the uh, Garmin Etrex 10. It's not an amazing um, unit, but you know, it does the job. I can mark down, you know, where I've seen chanterelles, where I've seen dryad saddles, where I've seen my lobster mushrooms, uh, hedgehogs, everything, morels. So, because you know, mushrooms are going to keep coming up uh, where you saw them last year. Now, it may not like sometimes they cycle. I find like sometimes I'll go look for morels where I found them last year, and you know, they cycle like every two years. Really depends on you know the local environmental conditions, the moisture levels pH of the soil, that kind of thing. So, um, but it's really important, you know, if you mark down where you found the mushrooms or, you know, if you're looking for fiddleheads, they're going to come up year after year. Again, the amount you find may vary based on the kind of, um, you know, weather and climate patterns that have been going on, but the GPS is super handy. So if you find something, mark it down and uh, next year you'll have less work to do in your scouting. Important to look for dead trees as well, because as you know, a lot of mushrooms actually break down uh, tree matter and decompose it. We may not always be foraging for edibles. Right here we have horse hoof fungus and that, um, if you harvest the inner layer of it, the amadou, makes an excellent fire starter. So 
You're going to want to flag something like this on your GPS just so that you know if you wanted to uh, make some fire starter, you've got some great tinder right in those mushrooms, those conks that you can see on the tree. And of course as well, you can use this stuff right here to start fire. This is the bark of the birch and it catches a spark really well and the resin in it really gets things going and you can get a fire started with this stuff. So also important to flag areas where you can get stuff to start a fire. So here's some ironwood. I'm pretty pumped to find this in the woods. This is a really good source of firewood. It's, uh, you know, it has very dense um, structure. Anybody who's chopped ironwood would know that. It's really good for axe handles and, uh, you know, using it for tools. It's extremely strong. The other thing I find around ironwood is dryad saddle, um, pheasant backs. So those are a type of mushroom that grow off of these trees. And pheasant backs are some of the first mushrooms I actually forage for in the spring. Um, they kind of smell like watermelon rind, a fresh smelling watermelon. So, uh, and they're really tasty if you just sort of cut off the, uh, the rim, like the edges of them and pan fry them, they're really good. So in my area, I tend to find them on a lot of hardwood, including ironwood. We're gonna be approaching some really mixed woodlands here with some conifers and some hardwood. Let's see what we'll be able to find in these areas. So right here is a mixed hardwood and coniferous stand. So we can definitely see some birch in here and also see some balsam fir. So things I would expect to find in here would be some luxinium species, uh, like the birch bolete, for example, and other bolete species. Probably also find, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, chanterelles, hedgehog mushrooms in here in the spring as well. And, um, you know, another thing that you can forage for is um, balsam fir uh, for needles to make a nice tea. Here's balsam fir, so they have a longer needle and you can pluck these off and put them in some nice hot water over a campfire and make some lovely balsam fir tea. Now also, um, you know, we'll be on the lookout for hemlock. Uh, hemlock sort of looks like balsam fir, but the needles are a lot smaller. You know, when I was in New Brunswick last, uh, last summer, um, the woods there, there was a ton of hemlock and let me tell you, I saw a lot of boletes and king boletes and now in those woodlands uh, it was amazing so be on the lookout for you know hemlock forests you'll find uh, you know king bolete in there uh, the porcini mushroom which is a prized culinary mushroom and uh, also you know even in these forests here with the the mixed forests I do find uh, I do find the porcini mushroom as well so I'm in the part of the forest now that's predominantly hardwood we've got some beech some maple and uh, the occasional um, you know birch and aspen I wanted to show you this tree right here this tree is a, uh, an, a cherry tree, so these are excellent trees for, you know, woodworking. Um, it's got the characteristic bark that looks like uh, burnt cornflakes. It's just very, very flaky bark. So this is a really beautiful tree. This is a cherry. So you can see in this area, there's a few aspens at the back there. At our cabin, I found aspen oyster mushrooms, uh, Pleurotus populinus, on those trees. So that'll be a spot I'm going to check out for sure. Because there's a mixture of hardwood in here, including beech, another thing I wanted to mention was that um, here is going to be excellent for checking out chanterelles and oyster mushrooms. Large dead aspens are excellent um, for wildlife, you know, like woodpeckers and things like that like to make their homes in there. So important to keep some dead snags around if you own a woodlot. Speaking of dead snags of wood, here uh, is some dead hardwood and let's take a look at what's on it. I think I've already found something I, uh, I like here. So if we go closer, we can see some turkey tail fungus right on. So um, again, it's gonna keep coming back year after year. And uh, if we take a look at it, it's a medicinal fungus. Ooh, it's really attached. It's got a pale buff underside or white underside and it's got uh, the colors of a turkey tail basically on top. This is a medicinal mushroom and uh, so I really wanna flag this on my GPS. Use turkey tail for lots of different things. Fabric dye, medicinal, you can make paper out of it. And I'm thinking I'm actually gonna try that this year. So. Very good. So often you'll find lots of dead trees. You're going to find some fungus. So I know a lot of you uh, are very familiar with the morel. So the yellow morel and the black morel uh, are very, very popular culinary mushrooms. Where would one find those? Well, I tend to find them um, in a few different areas. So I usually get a lot of black morels at the cabin and they tend to be in areas where there's some coniferous woods because we have, you know, mixed and coniferous woods. So I tend to find them uh, in that area. And the first thing you'll start seeing coming up in the spring is sort of those false morels, the gyromitra, which are not edible. Some people do, but I, I personally would not risk it. So anyways, 
I usually see those coming up first and then within a couple of weeks or so I start seeing the black morels and then I start seeing the yellow morels after that. Another great area to find morels uh, is burn sites. So if you've been in an area where there's been a forest fire, you'll have a huge growth of morels. Also in um, old apple orchards, they love hardwood. Um, you know, so you'll be looking in there, old maple forests, things like that. Um, lots of deciduous trees, obviously, you know, in Michigan where they have huge morel festivals. So uh, definitely hardwood conifer, you can find them. And you know, if you're near an old farm, an old apple orchard, score, you're gonna get lots of morels, most likely. We've had a really cold winter and morels need a certain, um, you know, amount of cold, really cold days for them to have a really good year the following spring. So we've had a very cold winter, we've had a very wet winter, so I'm very optimistic that the mushroom outlook for this year is gonna be great. So it appears now we're coming up into an open area. I'm really excited, I wanna to check to see um, if there's anything like old apple trees here in the field coming up. Uh, definitely this is an area that was an old farm field. It looks like it's confirmed, so let's take a look. Ha <laughs> ha, lo and behold, there we go. There's an old apple tree. So definitely this will be an area where I'm gonna go and check out in the spring for morels. Um, as you know, morels love areas where there's been old orchards and hardwood. So this will be a perfect spot to go check for morels come springtime. And uh, I think they'll be up in a couple of months. So awesome. Looks like the rabbits are active in here. Lots of wildlife. So uh, there's probably lots of good food sources in here for them. And looks like, uh, oh, we've got some uh, coyote tracks there, so excellent. Just pausing on the trail, there is some really fresh coyote scat. So we've got coyotes in the area, so be really careful. Uh, it has that white kind of color due to, you know, ingestion of bone and other things like that. So glad I keep my eyes peeled. So behind me and all around me right now, you can see staghorn sumac. Uh, they usually have beautiful red flowers on them that usually dry over the winter. Birds love to eat them, but you can also make a drink and a spice out of them as well. There is a poison sumac, but these are staghorn sumac, which aren't poisonous. Looks like the birds have really had at the seed heads this winter because it's been a long and a cold one. So I'll be sure to come back here to harvest some sumac. Other edibles that one can find in a field are, you know, clover, curly dock, uh, plantain, certain types of grasses, uh, all kinds of stuff actually, burdock. You could also find uh, some goldenrod, which you can use to make a lovely tea. So uh, lots of stuff in, in these fields. So this area I'm really excited about, lots of potential for foraging this year. And here's just what I was looking for. We've got a hawthorn here, and it looks like we also have some wild grape in here. So this is gonna be awesome. So there's the wild grape. You can characterize it by these little tendrils right here. So I'm gonna come back and check in on this uh, in the summer. So here's a hawthorn. Take a look at those sharp, sharp, Thorns. These are very painful. Uh, the northern shrike bird actually uses these to uh, impale its prey on, um, but the hawthorn has a lot of really tasty berries that I use to make uh, jelly and jam. You can make ketchup. Well, I just startled an eastern cottontail rabbit. I'm in a little bit more of the cedar swamp area here, and I see some coyote tracks. I just want to check things out. Here we go. Right in the center of your screen is an active coyote den. There's a lot of uh, coyote sign around here, a lot of urine marking the trails. Um, I'm gonna get a closer look. I don't think they're there at this point in time. See, there's a lot of urine marking the trail. There's also some rabbit urine around as well. So this is pretty cool. So another thing that could possibly be using this would be a porcupine. Um, you can sort of see some porcupine poop down there. Some discolored pee. So porcupine rabbits may go in there. Coyote could tunnel down in there. Certainly lots of trails, lots of active trails leading to and from it. So whatever it is, it's here. Love to set up a trail cam here to see what's going on and who's all using this little hole. Just behind me right there is uh, another entrance to the den. I do believe this is a coyote den. Um, there are tracks leading up to it, like fresh dog tracks. 
Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's very, very active. So um, they're likely out foraging right now, or maybe they're resting. I don't hear any noises from in the den. Uh, females are bred right now, and so the young will be hitting the ground uh, either this month, anywhere from now until May. So um, don't want to be hanging around here too often, especially at dusk or dawn. Um, especially animals can become more protective when they have young um, around them. So very cool to find this coyote den. There's fresh tracks leading right up to it. A few entrances. Quite often coyote uh, dens have many entrances and exits for safety. Um, but uh, yeah, you can see a lot of... Uh, oh, there's even some hair on the ground over here. Let's take a look. see some hair there on the ground, some urine, some hair up on the ice here, some rabbit poop and some porcupine poop. So I think what's happened is there's been a kill and it sort of dragged it off into the den to eat. And so that's why I'm seeing, you know, poop uh, from lots of different species. But if you take a look, oh yeah, let's look over here, guys. There's a porcupine quill. So we dragged a porcupine in here. And there's coyote hair right there, if you can see that. So he's had a feast of a porcupine and dragged the porcupine in there. So probably a porcupine shed some quills into its, uh, its little muzzle there. So it's probably a little sore, but there's some trails leading in and around to it. How neat is that? So interesting what you find, uh, the mystery is solved. You find the porcupine quills and the coyote hair. Looks like they had a good meal last night. Lo and behold by the den site, the mother load of turkey tail mushrooms. Now's the time to brush up on wild edible safety. Make sure that you are know exactly what you're picking and if it's toxic or not, very important. Let's talk about a couple of books if you're new to mushroom foraging or foraging for wild edibles. So I've got two great books uh, to introduce you to. One is called The Complete Mushroom Hunter. It's really good. It talks about some of the key edible mushrooms and some of the key poisonous mushrooms. Um, and it's really easily laid out. Starts all the way from the beginning, all about mushrooms. Um, so it introduces you guys to some really interesting mushrooms in here and tells you based on your location where and when you can expect to find them. So really good if you're new to mushroom hunting to get this book. Another book that's good to get started with is The Complete Idiot's Guide to Foraging. It's really good. Uh, it introduces you to the basics of, you know, plants, plant anatomy, trees, and, uh, you know, really lays stuff out for you um, nicely. Lots of colored pictures, when to pick the uh, plants. Even at the back of the book, it shows you some really awesome recipes. So these are two really beginner guides to um, foraging uh, for mushrooms and for wild edibles. Thanks so much today for tuning in everyone for our uh, scouting adventure. Don't forget, you know, it's, we're just on the cusp of spring. Get on out, enjoy the woods, learn to identify some trees in the winter so that you can maximize your foraging for the spring, summer, and fall. Hope you have a great week as always. Take care.